And I really would encourage people to think through that lens first. So no price is cheap enough if the, if the business is rubbish, right? So, uh, and you've mentioned Buffett. He talks about it's better to buy a wonderful business at a fair price rather than a fair business at a wonderful price. Why? Because the compound ability, as in the ability to compound, not a single word, the ability to compound for those quality businesses goes on for years and goes much higher than you even think they ever could. So get that right. Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of Conversation with Leaders. My name is Josh Gilbert, a market analyst at eToro. I'm happy to be your host today. Before we start, remember to like, comment and subscribe to the channel. Today, we're joined by Scott Phillips, Chief Investment Officer at The Motley Fool Australia. He's the director of the company's most exclusive service, Motley Fool Platinum. Scott is passionate about investing, having managed his own portfolio for over 20 years and working at The Motley Fool since 2011. Scott writes fantastic articles on The Fool website, and if you haven't before, go and check them out. Scott, thank you very much for joining us today. How are you doing, first and foremost? Josh, good day. You're very kind, mate. Thank you for those kind words. Uh, yeah, mate, I'm very, very well. We're, we're in the middle of earnings season, so it's, uh, things are pretty busy right now. Uh, but it's kind of the fun part of investing, right? It's where you get to see all the new information and, and try and digest it all. So, uh, yes, I'm very well and also very busy. Yeah, absolutely. It does make for a busy time of year when we only get those Australian companies reporting twice a year. But some would say maybe it's nice rather than having those <laughs> quarterly reports that we get from the US. Yeah. So let's start with a look at the markets and maybe sort of you know a little look at the macro environment as well. We've got rates in the US uh, and here in Australia that are sat at dec- decade highs. But we've maybe got a slight imbalance between the two central banks. The RBA is still taking a hawkish view on rates. But we've also got the US who looks set to cut pretty, pretty soon. How do you see both of those standings affecting shares until the year end? And do you think that the Fed rate cuts will act as a positive tailwind for global stocks? Yeah, great questions. First thing I should say, mate, I don't do predictions and I don't do short-term predictions either. So happy to talk about the macro environment, what I think it'll mean broadly for the companies that we own and, and maybe for share prices, but not with any specific predictions or, or forecasts. Uh, look, it's, a, it's fascinating. Uh, you know, the RBA is saying, the Reserve Bank of Australia, saying we're going to keep rates on hold at least until Christmas. That's what the RBNZ said in May, and they cut rates three months later. So I don't know, mate. It's, it's a fascinating time to be a market watcher, to be an economy watcher, because uh, you've got inflation that's still too high. The RBA is saying inflation's higher than we thought it would be and that we want, and yet we didn't hike rates last month. Okay, well, the economy is a bit weak, and there's reasons why they might not want to for unemployment and other reasons. But you've got this real disconnect between what they say the target is, how well we're going towards that target, and they kind of blink and say, yeah, but we don't care that much. Or at least we care, but we're not prepared to do anything about it. So at the moment, you've got, as you say, central banks in very different directions. Fair to say, I think the Australian economy is weaker than the US, though the downtrend in the US might be stronger than Australia. So it's possible uh, they sort of swing past on the downside. We'll have to wait and see what happens there. In terms of share prices, mate, a couple of interesting things. So earnings season has really showed the weakness of consumer spending right now. I do suspect that any reduction in rates, if and when it was to come here would be probably a bit of a uh, relief valve. We might see a little bit of that revenge spending that we heard about during uh, during COVID. Once people kind of figure, well, the, the, the top is in, uh, things are going to get better from here. We can go and start spending again. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see that. Uh, a low interest rate should be better for asset prices as well. So in theory, all things being equal, it should mean higher share prices rather than lower. Again, of course, if the market's already factored that in, then the news is already there. And that's the other thing. The event itself is important. But to the extent the market's already factored in an event, any event, including this one, in advance, maybe there's no upside left because we all think it's going to happen. You know, once you know it's going to happen or, or everyone believes it's going to, it's as good as already happened when it comes to asset prices. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, as you said, their markets are, are very forward looking in that sense. So, you know, it is always, you know, very positive to try and look a few steps ahead, which is, is never easy to do, but that's how the market looks. Yep. Um, and I want to talk, Scott, a little bit about the importance of investing in shares. We mentioned you know, COVID a little bit there and, and sort of how you know, share investing, I think, became a lot more prominent over that time. People maybe didn't have a lot to do, but also they had a little bit more extra cash to do in that time as well. Yep. But in Australia, the biggest investment most people own is property. Um, but as years have gone on, property has maybe become a little bit out of reach for many Gen Zs, millennials, etc. You've been a long advocate for shares maybe over property. Yep. Um, but what makes the share market a particularly compelling place for a long-term investment compared to maybe other asset classes? So that's a really great question. You framed it up beautifully, Josh. When it comes to property, here's, also, so here's the thing. We talk about shares, and most of us kind of can be tempted to think about that as 
the same thing as all businesses or business in general, right? Except it's not. In Australia, there might be 1,500-odd companies listed on the ASX, something like that, out of two and a half million uh, listed companies, or sorry, listed companies, um, registered companies. So you've got the top of the top of the top. You talk about property, we said the property market, we, we literally mean every single house in the country. So that in itself starts to give you a bit of a sense of why there's difference. There's some rubbish on the ASX, but there's also some really, really great companies. And generally speaking, the average ASX company for the hundred and something years we've had a market uh, has performed better than the average unlisted company. Not every unlisted company, not single unlisted companies, the average stock market company versus the average unlisted company Stock market tends to win. Why? Because the best businesses are list. Why? Because they get the best prices. If there's an incentive there if you have a quality business to put it on the market, get top dollar for your, for your shares. So already we're looking at a difference in composition between shares and property. Overlay that with the, the function of PE or prices, valuations for shares compared to valuations for property. Now, you talked about being out of reach, stretched, uh, stupidly high, I might call it, property prices and say, how do property prices go up from here? Okay, well, interest rates might come down a little bit. We've talked about that already. That means you can borrow more for the same repayment. It's kind of the way the maths works. So that would put upward pressure on house prices. So that's that's a, a cyclical impact, but it might push price up over the next year, two years, whatever the, the, the kind of loosening cycle is from the RBA. Plus, or times by, if you like, wage increase. Now, if you're only getting a wage increase on average of, be generous, call it 3.5%. It won't be that high, but let's say it is. 3.5%. Without rates moving... Your ability to repay a house increased at 3.5%. Houses can't, over the long term, increase faster than that. They just can't. Uh, short of, I don't know what you'd have to do. Maybe you could have a border in or something. The reality is, if my house now, I can afford to pay the repayments. If the price goes up another 10% every year, in seven years' time, that price has doubled. If my income hasn't doubled, how am I paying the extra repayments? I can't. So there is a structural impediment to house prices being able to accelerate at a given rate. Now, let's look at shares. We've already talked about the fact it's a subset of business. So company profits can increase faster than the per dwelling ability for me to repay. And they're a subset, so they can increase at the expense of other businesses. Now, there will be some people saying, well, the same is true of property. It's absolutely true. There's a property out there that's probably undervalued by 50% right now. And if I could find it, I could buy it and make a fortune. But if we look at the market for property and the market for shares, not for all businesses, for shares... I think there's just structurally good reasons why shares should do better. Last one, very quickly, franking credits. If you're an Australian investor, you know the tax advantages from not having your dividends double taxed, which simply means a 5% return in shares on a fully franked company is worth more than a 5% return on cash or property or art or any other asset class you might want to look at. So you've got those two structural advantages. Now, last one quickly. People say, you're a shares guy, Philip, you'd say that. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm a shares guy because I believe that, right? It's the other way around. I wouldn't do this job, I'd do something else. I, I invest in shares. I have invested in shares because I fundamentally believe the upside potential over the long term for a diversified portfolio is stronger in shares. That's why I own them. There's no point in the market. I could have my salary and, and go buy investment properties. Uh, my entire investable net worth outside my house is all in shares. Yeah. And I think it's really important to note there a couple of points. We sort of spoke about the the sort of the prices of, of properties and it basically being maybe unaccessible to a lot of people. And I think yep. how the share market has changed over the last, you know, couple of decades is that it's become a lot more accessible investing from, That's true. Um, yeah. you know, a few dollars as well. Compared to where I started, mate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so that's exactly it. And it, it, it may get yeah. to the point where we sort of, you know, it, you know, people can invest with a few dollars and then getting to the point where, you know, it, it is yeah. reasonable enough to then use as a deposit for a house, which is... Uh -huh. usually what people sort of look to um scott at the start of august anyone might have thought that the world was ending with some of the media headlines <laughs> surrounding yep. a market sell-off that we had and essentially it was the unwinding of the japanese carry trade and recession fears were rising this was a great mm -hmm. reminder that volatility happens and is essentially the price of entry into investing but uh -huh. In periods like that, how do you recommend that investors navigate market volatility? Because it was, if you looked at media, you know, a pretty worrying time, arguably. <laughs> Bloodbath was in the headlines. <laughs> Routh was in the headlines. Uh, X billion dollars wiped off the market. That one gets trotted every time the market falls. Uh, by the way, we're recording this only just over a few weeks later, uh, and the, the market's already above the levels it was, particularly in the US, before the fall. Not quite there in Australia at the time of recording, but probably not miles away. Um, so here's the thing, right? 
so you mentioned volatility. I, I say different version. Volatility is a ticket to the dance. It is literally, you, you don't get investing returns without volatility. You can't. You, you stay in cash and that's fine. Knock yourself out. Um, if you want to do that, that's, that's cool. But the, the reality is when you buy shares, you're buying and selling and holding, frankly, in a market where sentiment, uh, mood, emotions rule the day. And so when everyone's super optimistic, you get massive share price run-ups. When they're super pessimistic, you get big crashes. Most of the time, we exist somewhere between those two spots in periods of a little bit of optimism, maybe a lot, sometimes a little bit of pessimism, sometimes a lot. Uh, that's what happens. So the first thing is make your peace with it. And it seems glib to say, right? But if you don't, you literally shouldn't be investing. If you can't say to yourself, I know this happens, I know this will keep happening, this is what, this is what happens, this is what investing is like, um, then it's time to kind of maybe pull yourself out and just kind of work out what you want to do. Best way to do that is look at the Vanguard Index chart. Uh, they released it in on the 21st of August. Uh, and it's, again, just a really great summary of all the stuff that happened over that 30-year period. Wars, recessions, terrorism, uh, three market crashes, three big ones. The dot-com, the GFC, and the COVID crashes all happened in that period. Presidents, prime ministers came and went. And yet, and yet, investing in Australian shares got you a more than 13 times return. Investing in US shares a 23 times return, despite all of that. So it wasn't that it went up because there was none of that. That all actually happened. And by the way, 10 times as many potential fears and risks and panics and routes and sell-offs and bloodbaths uh, we just talked about. So it is taking that long-term perspective, mate. I fully expect over the next 30 years, we'll get a return that's directionally similar. It might not be, I think the average was, uh, was 9.1%, something like that. Uh, maybe we don't get that. Maybe it's 8, maybe it's 10, I don't know. But directionally, it's going to be that. You've got to be there. You've got to see it through. So the answer is, is know what you're doing, know what game you're playing. And if you're a long-term investor as I am, you're saying, you know what, i got decades. By the way, when I retire, I hopefully still have got decades left. So many investors think about from here to retirement as their, as their investable kind of time frame. The reality is most of them will be retired almost as long as we worked. And so your investing horizon is decades longer than your working life. And that's really, really important. So you get that right. You start to think about 30, 40, 50, 60 years into the future. What do I want that to look like? And that really reminds you that the long-term returns go to the patient and those that hang around. doesn't mean those, those periods of volatility aren't scary. It, doesn't, it, it still hurts, right? You've still got the knot in the stomach of, oh, geez, how bad could this be? This could be terrible. And so I, I got millions of people, not literally, hundreds of people on social media saying, oh, it's going to be there for this time. Uh, oh, you wait. Next Tuesday, it's going to crash. This is the beginning of the end. It wasn't. It could have been, but it wasn't. Uh, and the long-term story over more than a century, as I said before, is really, really positive with lots and lots and lots of those bumps and lumps as we go. Exactly. And I think, you know, a very good point there about looking at that sort of 30 year period. So much has happened over that time in a case of you know, ultimately zooming out and sort of having a look at that uh -huh. bigger picture and, and, you know, really analyzing that those things did happen and we are still where we are today. And I think a yep. big part of, you know, dealing with all of that is, is diversification. It is very important mm -hmm. in a portfolio. Yep. How, how would you say that an investor should approach diversification? And what are some of the common mistakes that you see from investors when they are trying to diversify? Mm. That's a really great question. Um, most investors should actually probably have a super diversified low cost index ETF and go fishing. Now, that's not good for your business, not good for my business, but most people should. If you haven't got the interest, the intellect, the passion, the time, the, the you know, emotional kind of fortitude, don't buy individual stocks. Buy ETFs, go fishing, you'll have a greater life. Like, it'll, it'll be fantastic. But if you're going to then start to look at individual stocks or build a, a portfolio of ETFs even, you want to know what you're doing when it comes to, as you say, diversification, Josh. And it comes down to understanding, having eggs in different baskets. And that's it's just basic common sense, right? Think about most, I'll talk about most Australians, right? So we have a job in Australia. We have a house in Australia. We have savings in Australian banks. We have our superannuation largely invested in Australia. Think about, and now, now, now let me tell you, the Australian economy is very, very small globally. Our equity markets are 2% of the world's equity markets. So you start to think about that. If, I used the example before. If you're at a real estate agent, so look, I'm looking to buy a house, but you need to do me a favor. Only show me houses in streets that start with letter E. You say, well, why would you do that? Well, that's why I just like the letter E. But you're missing out on all this. For Australians, home market bias is real, and we should probably have an overweighting to our home market relative to the rest of the world in that proportion. But when you think about the fact we're ignoring every other opportunity except those that happen to be on this little island on the, on the south side of the, of the globe... Um, we're missing a huge opportunity. So uh, not having eggs in the same basket is the first thing. The answer to well, the next bit, but also the answer to one of the mistakes people make is what is diversification? And it's not just, uh, people say to me, I'm diversified, I own all four of the big major banks. I'm like, you know what, dude, that's, that's not diverse. That's not how this works. Um, uh, you know, so, so yes, if one of them fails, the other three might not. 
But don't think about the companies, even the industries. Think about the economic and macro factors, the um, geopolitical factors, the you know economic factors that can impact a particular company or industry or sector or even a range of sectors. You might have uh, shares in a bank and a discretionary retailer. You say, look, I'm diversified across two sectors. Like, well, you know what? If the Australian consumer falls in a heap, we may see that, we may not this year or next year, then those two are both going to get smashed, right? They, they are not, because they're different sectors, sure, different brands, sure, but the same kind of idea. Instead of that, think about what would be more resilient in those circumstances. I want some money invested overseas. Roughly half of my portfolio is invested in the US markets, um, which also, by the way, in themselves have international exposure. Uh, why? I love Australia. I think we've got a great country. We've got a great stock market. The rule of law is fantastic. But do I want to therefore double down on that, say, all oh, my money's going to be here? Or do I want to say, well, just in case it doesn't work out as well as I hoped, I'd like to have some money elsewhere in the US, for example. Again, in the, uh, the other thing, though, by the way, in diversification is tech is a really great one, right? People talk about tech as this whole thing. Think about Amazon. I own some shares for the record. Think about Cisco, the network equipment maker. Think about Apple. They're all considered tech, right? But they are really, really, really different companies. Then add together uh, a Microsoft, largely software-based, uh, an ERP uh, system like SAP, for example, out of Germany. They are all, in theory, tech, but they have very different customer bases, very different dynamics, very different um, abilities to attract and retain and keep customers. And so they're all tech. In that case, you could have all five of those, I think I mentioned five, and actually be really, really diversified. It doesn't feel like it because it all feels like tech, but that's far more diversified than having three or four companies in three or four different sectors, all impacted by, say, consumer spending or something similar like that. And I think you made a really great point there about sort of those stocks being within tech and doing completely different things. And I think that's really important in the fact of understanding a business and, and knowing what the business does. You know, the uh-huh. great man himself, Warren Buffett, has always been a, you know, a, a big sort of sayer in you know, understanding the business. If you don't understand it, yep. don't invest. Yep. And I think that brings us on to maybe a, a question of you know, what are some of the key factors that you think investors should look at when yeah, yeah. evaluating a stock? You know, how can they better understand the companies that they invest in and and what they do to make sure it's not just you know a tech buy it's actually buying a business for how they make their money we have a um, we have a service at the motley fool it's called motley fool odyssey it's not an ad i'm just letting you know but one of the things i've i've i've, I've stolen and co-opted someone else's acronym and added my own to it and, and i'm I, well, I call it q garp right garp is growth at a reasonable price q is for quality and and when i think about how i'm selecting companies for that portfolio it's a long-term uh, portfolio we're looking for long-term returns. We're hoping to own most of those companies for years uh, rather than buying sell at, at the at the you know at a whim. And so in that order, we look at quality. Then we look at growth. In this case, it's not just the growth it's had, but it's growth potential. And then we look at the price we're paying. And I really would encourage people to think through that lens first. So no price is cheap enough if the, if the business is rubbish, right? So, uh, and you've mentioned Buffett. He talks about it's better to buy a wonderful business at a fair price rather than a fair business at a wonderful price. Why? Because the compoundability as in the ability to compound, not a single word, the ability to compound for those quality businesses goes on for years and goes much higher than you even think they ever could. So get that right. The price is secondary. It's not irrelevant, but it's secondary to my long-term compounding ability. If you buy something that's 20% undervalued and the valuation gap closes, you made 20%, great, sell it, take your money, then find somewhere else to put the money. If you can find a business that can grow sustainably at above average rates for preferably decades, you've got to make one really good decision and let it go. So let's go to quality first. It, it, there is no formula. If there was a formula, I'd write a book and make a fortune and, and you know, it's all fine. There's, there is no formula. But what you're looking for is businesses that have things that mean they are more likely to attract, and this is more customers who spend more, more often. So you want to have more people coming through the door. Can I attract more? Am I attracting more customers? Can I keep attracting more customers? Really, really important. What am I doing that's bringing them to me? Secondly, more often. Are they shopping with me, buying from me, using my services more regularly, more often? That might be cross-selling, for example. We know plenty of uh, great uh, tech companies is land and expand. You get the customer, and then you sell them more modules than what you're doing, and then you want to do it more frequently. So, so uh, sorry, uh, more customers, more products, more frequently. So you've got the combination of more of it and using you more regularly for those those purposes. So think about that. And I think, take a, pick a, retail is really easy. Right? Retail is a great way for investors to get into it. Think about you walk past a, you're in the local Westfield, you walk past the shop, and there's a whole lot of people in there. And the next time you see a lot more people in there, you, well, they're doing something right. What are they doing right? And then you start to think, hey, what is it about that shop that's attracting those people? Maybe it's the price, maybe it's the promotion, maybe it's the brand, maybe it's the range. Start you know, asking yourself those questions. As a shopper, you know how you shop. That's why retail is such a great learning ground for, for investors because 
we're, we are customers, right? We know, think about the, the, the businesses you use yourself. Why do I use them? What do I like about them? Why do I think they're special? Why do other people think they're special? So that's where you want to start with. You also want a great business engine, mate. And this gets a little bit balance sheety, a little bit profit and loss. I won't go too deep into it, particularly in this audio visual format. But you want to find a business that actually is able to turn that into a really, really nice profit at the end of the day, right? You want sales that are growing. You want profits that are growing. And you want a decent profit margin. Now, the margin is different for every retailer and every let alone across broader, broader, broader business landscape. Uh, but you want a business that can turn those sales into profits at a better rate over time. And that's kind of, without getting too much into it, that's really what you're looking for when it comes to quality. The growth bit is just making sure there's enough growth left. One of the biggest mistakes I made in my investing career wasn't the most money I lost, but it was just a dumb mistake. I bought shares in Coca-Cola Amatil back when it was a listed company on the ASX. And it had all those quality things going for it. Man, I mean, there are Coke fridges everywhere. You know, that they make a dozen or dozens of different products. They're in every fridge. They're in demand. They charge massive premiums for what's otherwise sugar water. Um, this is just an absolute machine of a business. What did I miss? Well, I just kind of described it. It's everywhere already. Mm-hmm. So where was the growth going to come from? How, I, how do you get people to send, you know, put more Coke down their gullets every day, week, month, year? That was the case 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Now, we're kind of pretty saturated. Any growth that did come was going to be pretty moderate. So you've got to have that growth runway left. Have they got room to expand? Our big banks, no room to expand. Our big two supermarkets, no room to expand. doesn't make them bad investments, but just means their growth potential is really, really limited. And then you get to price. And I won't go too much into that, but effectively just paying a price, that means if that growth is realized, you're able to earn decent returns from today. There, every, investment's a, every company is a, is a terrible investment and a great investment depending on the price. Some they have got to be almost exactly free to be worth a great investment, but there's plenty of great high-quality businesses that are simply too expensive to buy because you won't get the returns you're looking for. You almost get back to property at some point. You know, great house, but if you want me to pay $4 million for it, I'm probably going to give it a miss because the upside is not there anymore. Yeah, some really, really great points. And I think it just goes to the fact of, you know, trying to simplify investing. Sometimes it can be mm-hmm. overcomplicated. And we can yes. think also to the, the the great investor himself, Mr. Peter Lynch, who obviously speaks mm-hmm. to some of the points that, that you made there and also got some of his best investment ideas from, from his wife and using those yeah, uh, yeah. sort of same ideas, you know, having a look at retail, seeing cues and, and, and what may have sort of growth potential. Um, and we also mentioned a little bit about Warren Buffett there as well, mm-hmm. who actually recently recently rebalanced his portfolio. He sold out about a 50% stake in his Apple position. Still left it as his largest position, but it was more of a a rebalancing, maybe something to do with with some tax implications as well. But it is a great reminder about rebalancing a portfolio to mitigate risk, especially if a stock outperforms and, and grows to be a large holding within the portfolio. On that, how do you think investors should consider rebalancing their portfolios? And, and maybe what are some of the signs that it is time to actually do that? That's a really great question. I'm not someone who rebalances as a matter of course. So I don't think you should necessarily... I'm not someone who invests top down. I don't invest thematically. So I don't want to have 50% of my portfolio in mining or 20% in tech or uh, 40% value and 50% percent growth. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not doing those maths from a top down perspective. What I think is important, though, and you've already mentioned it, is understanding the composition of your portfolio and the risks to your portfolio. We talked about diversification. Another one is diversification when, when it comes to the, the, the size and import of individual companies in the portfolio. So the biggest reason for me, you've already touched on it, to, to rebalance at least. Uh, rebalance in, infers there's some holistic thing going on. I mean, I'm going to, just, I'm going to do the politician's thing, mate, and answer the question I wish I was asked, which is when would I, when would I sell down a company I liked? Uh, or when would I consider reinvesting or changing my portfolio allocations? Um, which is kind of what you asked, but I just want to kind of re- reframe it. And that's exactly in those circumstances. When I when the company is simply too big, particularly if it's done really, really well, don't sell down for the sake of it. Don't sell down necessarily to a target percentage, although you can if you want to. Um, by the way, you know, let your winners run to the most part is probably pretty good advice. Most investors will find a very small handful of companies will deliver most of their rewards in a portfolio. That's a feature, not a bug because the market gets it right more often than not, right? So if you have a portfolio of 20 companies, there's a very, very good chance you'll do mediocre returns on 12 or 13 of them, maybe even 15, because the market's roughly right. So your chance of being that much better than the market over any length of time on your entire portfolio, really, really small. You'll have a couple of stuff ups. I've had those. Most will be there or thereabouts in the market. A couple will do really well. So don't cut them off too early. If they jump 10, 20, 30%, don't take your money away and go. Let it go. If we just talked about you know quality and compounding for the long term, uh, some of my best companies, I own some Berkshire Hathaway shares, by the way, I have for, jeez, at least 15 years, probably closer to 20 these days. Um, 
because it's, and, and it's got bigger. Why? Because I held it for a long time, and it's a really big chunk of my US portfolio. But I sleep very well at night because it's Berkshire Hathaway, right? Um, so think about the size. Think about the risks facing the business in that context. If you've got a really risky business that's really big, you really want to think differently about it. If it's Berkshire Hathaway, nothing's perfect, but you can probably afford to be a little bit generous with the portfolio weightings. Um, think about the combination in the portfolio as well. If a couple of businesses start doing well, individually they might be smaller than you're worried about, but add them together, go back to that risk we just talked about. If if um, e-commerce has done particularly well, right, and you own Amazon plus whatever, whatever, um, individually they might still be small enough, but as a group you're thinking, hang on, 25, 30% of my portfolio is now in this sector. That feels pretty uncomfortable. I might want to rebalance that to remove the risk out of that part of the portfolio. So they're the major ones. The other one, two reasons, other reasons to sell. If you lose conviction, if a company doesn't, even, maybe if it's maybe it's smaller than what you bought, but you, you like it a whole lot less because the results have been disappointing. The growth hasn't been there. Profitability has been a bit ordinary. Even if it's smaller, still a very good reason to consider, is that still too big because I no longer have the degree of conviction? The other one is Australia, if you've got a better better idea. If you've got something you really want to buy and you haven't got enough money to do it with the cash you're adding to your portfolio, you look around and say, well, I want some money for this thing. Over there, there's these companies that maybe I don't love them as much or the valuations aren't as attractive or they are simply too big in the portfolio. They've got too big a size. A great reason to sell down is to say, I'm going to reduce my risk on that company and put that money into an even better idea. That could be a great way to do it as well. Um, just lastly, really, really quickly, ETFs I mentioned before, you can just be an ETF-only investor, but they're also a great way to add some really, really cheap diversification to a portfolio. If you're only investing on the ASX, be on some US exposure, there's ASX-listed US ETFs, right? So throw a couple of those in, gives you instant diversification across the across the portfolio. Uh, it keeps your cost down, obviously, as well, but just means you can think differently about the rest of the companies that you own. Yeah, great points. And I think to that as well, it's quite interesting to see the, the growth that we've seen in, in uh, you know companies here in Australia, some of the the most ten baggers have been found here in in Australia, yeah. and it talks to the point of you know not sort of needing to, to sort of sell out of a company unless those fundamentals change, unless um, you know those earnings are, are you know any different to when you you sort of first owned it. Um, so re- some really really great points. That's Finally, hard. Scott, I wanted to ask maybe some of the advice that, that you would give to beginner investors versus maybe experienced investors again there's going to be people on different journeys who are yeah. maybe just starting and those that are you know a little bit experienced but not not sort of right at the top of their game are there specific strategies or considerations that you would say vary based on experience yeah i the beginning investors diversify quickly we've talked a lot spent a lot of diversification we probably should because it's really important but as a beginning investor you're your view of the market is going to be really impacted by what happens in the first year or so of your, your time investing. And we see so many investors who either win big quickly and then lose it and give up, or who lose straight out of the gate and say, ah, oh, I knew that thing was due. I never should have invested at all. I'm going to take my money back out of here. I'm never going to touch shares. This is terrible. And so having the right expectation of what shares can do, which is long-term fantastic, short-term super volatile, start with that expectation, right? Tomorrow could suck. And if it does, you go, I kind of expected that. Didn't like it. Don't want it. But that's I knew, knew it was going to happen. I made my peace with it. But also be diversified really quickly. Now, if you, have, if you only bought one stock and it goes to the moon, you're going to think, gee, I wish I'd kept that. But if you own very, very quickly, and you can, you mentioned that you can trade really cheaply and with really small, amount, really small amounts of money these days, um, build a portfolio of 5, 10, 15 business really quickly, even if you never add to them again. Because what it does is it means that your 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, 1,500 bucks you start with get spread really nicely, and one particular company is not going to impact your emotional state, your approach to investing, your willingness or ability to stay invested because it just kind of hurts. Um, so really think about that. For beginning investors, it's really set yourself up so that you're not going to be dis- discouraged or dissuaded from continuing to invest. That's the number one mistake people make is just not staying the course. So that's my best advice to, to give yourself the best chance of staying the course, of being there. And again, throw some ETFs in if you want to to give yourself that broad exposure for the same reasons, right? You get that instant diversification. Um, that way you've got you know literally hundreds of companies in your portfolio with just one, one investment. For experienced investors, I think it's not all that different. But what I think you need to be thoughtful about is portfolio allocation as your portfolio continues to grow. And I think... We can tend to fall into the trap of whatever's made me money so far must therefore keep making me money after that. Now, we talked about some companies that will, so that's really, really important. But we see a lot of experienced investors or intermediate investors kind of come to a bit of a stop. They, they do well early on, and they keep investing in the same sorts of things, get to a point where maybe the thesis has played out. We mentioned banks before. They had a great 30 years up until about 10 years ago. Why? Because they were tiny to start with, or relatively small, newly privatized, 
uh, growing, gobbling up market shares, making acquisitions, getting bigger and bigger. All these and Coles were the same. And then you get to a point where you're like, well, that's, the, that, that's done now. Hmm. I'm not saying sell your shares in banks. I'm not saying sell your shares in supermarkets. What I'm saying is the next leg of growth for your portfolio may well come in different areas. So don't look too much at what's got you here. If there's still plenty of opportunity, knock yourself out. Go for a stay invested. I've been in Berkshire, as I said, for years. I hope not to sell because I hope they keep growing the business. That being said, there's other businesses like Coca-Cola and Amatil. I went, the growth's are pitted out now. I'm kind of done here. It's time to look somewhere else for the next leg of growth. Not because I want to be overly active. I'm not an active investor at all. I'm very, very, um, uh, not passive, but when I buy, I buy for the long term and try not to sell anytime soon. But when the thesis is played out, it's played out, you're done. It's time to then look elsewhere. No, you don't have to sell. But it's adding more money to your portfolio. Put them in the best places looking forwards, not the best places looking backwards. Just because the money is made for you that way doesn't mean the next leg will be made the same way. Absolutely. And I think the first point that you made there about sort of, you know, not letting emotions come over is a great point. And we, we've seen that just recently, having that plan and, and sort of sticking to it, yep. um, because it's a great time when things do get difficult. You made good ideas when, uh, you know, sort of your, your centers were less heightened, your emotions were mm-hmm. less heightened because, you know, the, the markets were in, in the red. And then, you know, the second point as well, sort of looking at being flexible, um, you know, and not sort of being one way is, is also yep. you know, a, a really great point. Um, Scott, it's been been a pleasure to have you on today some really great insights on that episode today thank you so much for joining us thanks josh my pleasure it was a lot of fun to make sure you stay informed on markets head over to the etoro academy and stay tuned in to conversation with leaders to get the latest from the experts click subscribe and don't miss a beat thanks for watching and see you next time